In Genesis 6, God declared judgment. In Genesis 7, judgment comes. God sends Noah and his family into the ark and then shuts them in. And what follows next is the flood is unleashed. The question arises, how long did the flood last? Calculating all the numbers in Genesis 7 and 8 would indicate it lasted for approximately one year, which is possible, but the numbers in Genesis might be symbolic. As we noted in our video on Genesis 5, the text employs a lot of symbolic numbers for theological messaging. The duration of the flood seems to fit with this textual and cultural context. For example, the flood account repeatedly employs exact numbers like 7 and 40. 7 is a sacred number and it is often used to symbolize completion and shows up throughout the early chapters of Genesis. In fact, it shows up in the flood account exactly 10 times, another sacred number used with 7 to get a multiple of 70. Kenneth Matthews says, 7 indicates that the animals and birds are considered a full complement adequately representing the whole created order. Seven is also used for time lengths from God giving instructions to when the flood arrives and the final intervals before Noah leaves the ark, possibly indicating different types of completion. The number 40 is used for the duration of rain and has parallels in other places in scripture as an important number. Both Isaac and Esau just happen to be 40 years of age when they marry Moses remained on Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, and his life is divided into three periods of 40 years. Israel's spies are in the land for 40 days, and then Israel in turn spends 40 years in the wilderness. Nahum Sarna notes the number 40 is often paired with a time of renewal or atonement. In the flood account, the land must be renewed and atoned for, which explains why the authors would pair it with the symbolic number that often represents that theme. John Walton and Tremper Longman say, All of these are identifiably formulaic numbers that consistently carry rhetorical value. Whether the biblical text is interested in commenting on calendrical issues, as Qumram interpretators thought, the fact remains that the evidence from the ancient world and biblical usage indicate that we are not to read these time frames as specific or precise designations of actual time spans. We cannot reconstruct how long the rain lasted or the lengths of the aftermath of the flood from the information given. That sort of information is not given. Instead, it is designed to convey the massive scope of the cataclysm. But beyond this, the event carries theological and moral issues for many. Why would God literally drown everyone, even the children and infants? But did he? This is often assumed as an indirect consequence of a flood, but let's remember this is an assumption not mentioned in the text. What does the biblical text say and actually imply? Looking back to Genesis 6, let's remember the flood was brought with remorse. This is not something God wants to bring about, and it grieves him to do this. So no one is happy about what needs to be done. Second, it is philosophically impossible for God to kill anyone the way a human kills someone. When a human kills someone, they remove that person from their plane of existence for selfish and hateful reasons. Since God is on all planes of existence, it is logically impossible for him to murder someone the way a human might. Instead, he is just moving people from one plane of existence to another. So this is not murder since God is not removing people from existence but just placing them on another plane of existence. We should think of God's actions of ending a life analogously to how this happens in a dream world in the movie Inception. When you kill someone in a dream world, you are not ending their life, but moving them up to another plane of existence. Likewise, it is not immoral for God to end a life because being on all planes of existence, he cannot kill like a human does when they commit murder. You may not emotionally like the idea of God ending a life, but it doesn't follow that it is immoral due to his ontological differences. 
Third, it is possible there were no children that died in the flood. This might sound implausible on the surface, but nevertheless, it very well could have been the case. Let's remember textually and geologically, there is no reason to suggest the flood was global, but only regional within the area of modern-day Iraq and eastern Arabia. That limits the scope of the damage it could have done. But also remember, the flood was sent because of violence that was on the face of the land, and the biblical text treats the time of Noah as an anomaly, unlike anything the world has since seen, implying the violence was worse than anything experienced in more recent history. In other words, this was a special circumstance in this one area and with such a high degree of sin that it required immediate justice. It is best compared to a later event in Genesis, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham asked God to spare the cities of the plain if there is just 10 righteous people inside, and God agrees. But such a thing was not found, and thus Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Now combine that with how scripture implies there is an age of accountability, implying that people have to have the ability to consciously do evil, which many children are incapable of. Therefore, it is likely God destroyed Sodom because there literally was no one innocent or righteous within these cities. It's not like God is going around in the biblical text destroying city after city just because there were sinful people there, even though sin was a rampant problem, but not a problem that required total destruction. Sodom is set up as a special circumstance where not even one innocent person could be found. And if things were as bad as the biblical text claims, then the people would have been so evil it is doubtful children would have survived living in such conditions or people wishing to protect their children would have already fled to another region for safety. Likewise, the flood is set up as a special circumstance that doesn't happen all the time. The people were so violent, there was literally no innocent life left. Children were likely victims or family-oriented people would have fled the region or have been victims themselves. Noah would have remained to be a herald of righteousness and preach condemnation on the corrupt people. Either way, the text indicates the land was filled with violence and that all the people apart from Noah had become corrupt. Thus, there were no innocent lives that died in the flood. If someone is going to say the biblical flood was immoral, they should at least judge it by what it actually says, not what they think happened based on conjectures. And the text indicates the flood was sent to destroy sinful, violent people not innocent lives. Thus, the flood washed over the land, washing away the sin of old. But God remembered Noah and all the animals and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. God's judgment washed away the violence, but it also brought a new hope, which is revealed as the waters subsided in Genesis 8.